We're going to finish chapter 10 with part 5, Extremes of Intelligence. Now throughout the chapter we've talked about intelligence as a combination of both our genetic and environmental influences. And based on that broad spectrum of genetic underlyings and environmental effects, we can end up with people at both ends of the spectrum of intelligence. If you remember this bell curve of intelligence from part three in this chapter, we have our average individuals right in the middle here using our IQ score from some of the tests we've already discussed, where most people are going to sit at the average with an IQ of 100. But at the very extremes, we can have people who have very superior intelligence, or we can have people with an intellectual disability. I will take a moment here to note that the textbook uses the term intellectually disabled. Um, however, I was always taught that you should say person with whatever it is we're talking about. Um, I use this when I talk about people with schizophrenia or other mental disorders because you want to make sure that you talk about them as people first. So if my terminology is a little bit different from the textbook, that's why. Um, I'm just trying to be as inclusive as possible. But in this section here, we're going to talk about those two extremes, the intellectually gifted and people with mental disability. So let's start with the intellectually gifted. And so the cutoff for this definition will change depending on your source. Some places are going to cut uh, very high. Um, and even within the textbook here, they talk about very superior being the upper 1%. But we're actually going to talk about people who are above this 130 IQ point. So IQs of 130 or higher, and that's going to place them in the top 10% of the population in terms of IQ. From what we've already discussed with theories of multiple intelligences, you could expect that these people with very high IQs might be enormously talented in one area of mental competence. For example, they may be very, very good at solving mathematical problems, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be excelling in all areas of intelligence or in all areas of their lives. In most cases, individuals with high IQ scores might be very, very good in one category, but are fairly average in other categories of intelligence. So even when we see people in this 150 range of IQ, we're still going to see that they're going to excel usually in one area of intelligence and be fairly average in others. So they might be phenomenal with vocabulary, with verbal skills, but maybe not great at math or the other way around. It all depends on where their abilities lie. And this brings us full circle back to talking about eminence, the same thing that we talked about at the very beginning of the chapter with Galton, where we were evaluating if people who were successful and extraordinary in life had these underlying mental abilities. But yet again, we find that only a small number of those especially gifted children, the individuals at the very, very high end of this IQ curve, end up having true eminence, true success or fame or um, notoriety for their abilities later in life. So again, we don't have this clear link where people who are very, very intelligent are also very, very successful. When eminence happens, it seems to be because of three interacting factors that lead them to attain that eminence. For someone of um, the intellectually gifted variety to achieve eminence, their skills, their highly developed mental abilities should probably also overlap with their chosen field. So they might have sort of the highly developed general mental abilities, but they should come with spe specific abilities that relate to their chosen field. So are they working in an area where they can make the most of their special abilities? If they're a math genius, are they working 
in the mathematical field? Or have they found that their heart wants them to be an artist? Um, because if they're not making use of their gifted abilities or whatever we want to call them, then maybe they're not going to overachieve, they're not going to attain eminence because there isn't that lineup between what they're very, very good at and what they choose to do. The next factor that seems to be related to whether um, highly intelligent individuals gain eminence in the future is their ability to creatively solve problems. So if they are phenomenal at memorizing things, they are really good at remembering facts and ideas, but aren't very good at creatively solving new problems, then they might not excel in that field because all they're doing is obtaining more of the same information. They're not generating anything new and exciting to create that eminence. And the last of these factors is motivation and dedication. Do these people have the drive to make use of their abilities? Do they have the dedication to stick with it and follow through to attain this eminence? And so we can look at all of these factors and see it from both sides. So children who show intellectual ability, who have very high IQs, aren't necessarily going to be uh, attaining eminence in their adult life. But the other way can also be true, where you don't have to be um, intellectually gifted to achieve eminence. Um, the textbook uses the example of Charles Darwin, who as a child didn't show any particularly gifted abilities, didn't have an extraordinarily high intelligence as they viewed it, but he had the motivation and dedication to achieve eminence later in life. So. You don't have to be super intelligent to achieve eminence, and um, those who are very intelligent aren't necessarily going to be eminent. This is also probably a good place to mention that children who fall, oops, wrong way. Oh no, I was going the right way. Children who fall on this end of the bell curve, if they're in school and they're taking normal classes at the normal age-appropriate level, we may encounter problems where they lose motivation and dedication just simply from the environment that they're in. If they're not being challenged, if they're not being pushed or um, motivated to interact and learn, then they might not end up succeeding later in life. A lot of very intelligent people end up dropping out of school or finding other ways to educate themselves because the school system isn't ideal for their capabilities or how they learn. Um, and that's interesting to keep in mind because the school system is mostly designed to deal with people who are in the average range. So they don't do well with people who are very intelligent they don't necessarily do well with people who have mental disabilities either. Um, and that brings us to our next point where we can discuss very briefly um, people with intellectual disabilities. Now we can go back to our curve here and um, in this range at the very bottom of our bell curve, we have three to 5% of individuals will fall under the category of having an intellectual disability. Individuals with mild disabilities can still attend school and can still move through the normal schooling system, but if, if their disability is more severe, they may require special training, special teaching, special environments in which to learn to help accommodate for their ability to learn. And these disabilities can cause problems with reading, writing, memory, mathematical computation. Again, with that idea of theories of multiple intelligences, you can have issues in different areas of intelligence. Now the cause of these intellectual disabilities can come from multiple sources, the same as with intelligence, or the same as with, um, Make sure I use the right term, the intellectually gifted side of things. Um, so there can be genetic bases, there can be environmental influences. 
A lot of times, these difficulties come from having poorly developed problem-solving strategies, but there may also be um, issues with the formation of the structures that are involved in different functional aspects of the brain. Back in uh, Psych 104, you would have talked about executive functions like planning, reasoning, um, evaluating feedback, and those could be involved in uh, mental disabilities. For the most part, when we're talking about uh, mild disability, that could have a genetic basis. However, the more uh, extreme disabilities are usually going to come from something environmental. Or in the case of some genetic disorders, it could come from just an accident during cell replication or meiosis. So an example of that would be Down syndrome which is caused by having an extra chromosome at chromosome 21. So this isn't something that you inherit from a parent, but it is caused by the genetic sides of things because there was an error in separating chromosomes. There are also environmental factors like accidents at birth where children are deprived of oxygen and that limits their development in their brains or even things like drugs or alcohol consumed by a mother during pregnancy. These can all affect the development and the intellectual capacity of individuals who are born. Now, despite the fact that I have gestured to this range on the graph of IQ scores, where people with an intellectual disability tend to fall somewhere between a score of 50 and 70 for IQ, the DSM-5, the most recent version of the DSM, has shifted away from just using IQ as an indicator of intellectual disability. And so now there are actually individual tests that will look into whether or not someone qualifies as having an intellectual disability. So it's not just IQ anymore, there are additional tests to evaluate um, what kind of intellectual disability someone might have before diagnosing them with any particular disability.